Okay, I heard my chime. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Beck. I'm with the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, NIGMS at NIH. I'll be your host today. We have folks from uh, several of the other agencies, and we're going to give you a little overview of the opportunities for funding STEM games for learning, behavioral changes, uh, whatever your area of interest is. And we're only going to have a few minutes to give you a general overview. So you're going to get a taste of this. This is kind of like a, a snacking to find out what the agencies are funding, examples of them. Uh, the important thing is to contact people. You know, all of these programs will have something called an FOA, a funding opportunity announcement. And usually, in fact, always towards the back, there'll be agency contacts. So often if you have questions about the actual application process or somebody, if you want to talk about the science and content, that's the program officer. And that's, that, that's what we are. And then there's always a budget person asks whether or not you can um, charge for something. So next slide, please, David. Oh, and we're also going to have... Uh, you can, I believe you can uh, type in questions and then we'll have a, a open time, 30 minutes at the end. We can go longer if we have more questions. So uh, this is a, I've and been we are recording a time the session. Sorry, oh, and we are recording the session. Yes, we're recording the session. Thank you, David. So this is a great example of a, a real cross section of the federal agencies. We have NIH, which is the uh, health and medicine. We have Department of Education, NSF, which is more the hard science, USDA, and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, which is a, a new agency for me. But you're going to really get an example of the types of things that are funded. Next slide. So here's the contact information for everyone. So we are, as you mentioned earlier, we're recording this, but we'll also uh, make this available probably as a PDF because it's a pretty big document. So if you want to contact me uh, afterwards, we can send you a a power or actually a PDF of the presentation itself. So you can, you know, take notes, but it's more to listen and think about the kinds of questions you may ask. But like I said, here's the contact information for the presenters. Next slide. So what are the SBI or SP, STTR programs? So this was a concept created by Congress back in the early 80s. And the whole point was to figure out how to jumpstart small companies because small companies often have uh, diversity in their workforce. Uh, there's lots of them. So this is a way to um, put your put your chips on a lot of different squares because as you know, success rate for startups is is after 10 years, it's is pretty small, you know, less than 10%, maybe not even that. But bottom line, this whole program uh, feeds a lot of the important concepts in uh, commercialization and just the economy. So uh, it provides R and D for the federal government. It commercialization, it commercializes uh, things in the private sector. It stimulates innovation. Uh, clearly, uh, diversity is linked with innovation and having a small company uh, that's hungry is always innovative. Um, um, and it also um, targets uh, entities, women, low socioeconomic status, companies in, in small states, um, folks who normally wouldn't find funding for their interesting ideas. And then also through the SDTR program, the Small Technology Transfer Program, it leverages investments, either academic or governmental in research institutions. So it, it has a lot of functions. Next slide. But the whole point is this is, this is putting money into a lot of small companies that have really risky ideas that um, they're interesting, they're great ideas, but they need to be vetted. They need to have some uh, reality checks. And so these are, these are like, as, as it says here, technically, technically sound, but unproven ideas. So these are, these are things that are too risky for the venture capital, the VC. Uh, they like this program because uh, when a company comes out of a phase two, they have enough data and it's clear whether or not, or whether or not it's likely this program will be successful. Next slide. So this is the infamous Valley of Death. And I spent a decade in biotech. I was with some small companies, large companies, and uh, we got to the point where kind of the third square of the feasibility, but we were also down to the bottom of the Valley of Death and we never got out. Uh, we did have a small um, SBIR program, 
But this is where the government and the SBIR, SDTR program fits in. Next slide, please. So you can see the phase one is just concept development. So it's six months, proof of principle, you create your device and you do some quick testing and it's just whether or not it looks like it's gonna fly. And for the NIH, the cap is 256K. Each agency is a little different. In fact, you're gonna see that all the agencies have the same starting point, which is the funding announcement and the same endpoint, uh, the issue awards. But what happens in between is very different for each agency. So the phase one, as I mentioned, is just proof of, <clears throat> proof of concept, six months. And the phase two is two years, and it's uh, 1.7 million. So the reality is if, if with $2 million in two and a half years, you can't take your great idea and get to the point where somebody's interested in it, it's probably time to find another new great idea. Next slide. So what does a company look like? It's, it's an SBC, a small business concern. So for-profit. And sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, I want to create something, give it to the schools. That doesn't work. You need to have something that's going to create a market. It has to be done in the U.S. and it's on the R&D. You're not purchasing uh, components and putting them together. Next slide. Okay, there's, as I mentioned, there's two versions, the SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research, and the STTR, which is the tech transfer. So in terms of partnering, it permits it with the SBIRs. STTR, you must partner with your research institution. The investigator, over 50% has to be with the SPC, and it's, it's more flexible with the STTR. And in terms of the work requirement, SBI, you can subcontract about a third of it in phase one, 50% in phase two, and then there's a, a different criteria for the STTR. Next slide. So now I'm going to transition. So that's just the big picture. And one of the things that's critical is if you're interested, you go to the funding announcement and don't give it a quick read. You know, look at it, study it. Um, I'll show you one uh, of the funding announcements that covers a lot of agencies, and then there's others that are more specific. So as I mentioned, I'm with the National Institutes of Health, one of the components, uh, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Next slide. So NIH has 27 institutes and centers, and most of you have heard of the Cancer Institute, Heart, Lung, Blood, Everybody knows uh, NIAID, that's where Dr. Fauci is located. Uh, the budget, actually that's last year's budget, but the budget is about, I think $47 billion now. Next slide. So here is the breakup. Some of the institutes are very tiny, you know, $200 million. NIGMS is the fourth largest. So the budget is $3.0 billion. And this is important because Congress has mandated that an agency whether it's NIH or Department of Defense, has to devote 3.2% of what they get from the federal government to support SBIRs. And I think it's 0.35%. I can't remember what it is for the SDTR. It's less. With NIGMS, with the budget of $3 billion, next slide, you can see that the, uh, the amount of money each year, the money in the checkbook for SBIRs is $91 million. So our pay line is very generous. And I think some of the other uh, speakers will have some information on, on, on their success rates. But this is the environment. So it's, it's a good place. And uh, remember, the, the ideas uh, in general are more, gen more uh, global in terms of the topics. Next slide. Okay, with the NIH, we have these FOAs, Funded Funding Om Opportunity Announcement. One of them is called the Omnibus. And if you read the title, you can see it covers a number of agencies, NIH, CDC, FDA. Um, and within the NIH, it covers, I think, about two thirds of the institutes and centers we showed. So this document is the, is the major funding announcement, funding FOA. And when you go there, there's another down at the bottom of the first page. It says topics are listed. There's another 130 page document. And it will tell you what various components within the NIH, for example, heart, lung, blood, the kinds of things they're funding. Next slide. So this is a focused FOA. So this is one specific for a program at NIGMS called SEPA, Science Education Partnership Award. And about 10 years ago, I realized we, within the SEPA program, which is a, a five-year program to provide resources for students and teachers in underserved communities and uh, environments we're going to college and careers in science was never on the radar. So this is specifically evolved out of the SEPA program and its focus. It has one receipt date per year. So 
you're going to see within the agencies, this is a starting point, this FOA. Next slide. So let's, let's differentiate between the omnibus. Remember, that's the one for a lot of different federal agencies and a big chunk of the NIH institutes and centers, the ICs, versus what we call the STEM IDM. And I hate to use the, uh, this IDM concept, but we're not allowed to use the word games. So next slide. So here are the two face pages for the omnibus. And there's really no difference. They have the same topics, the same dollar amount, same review criteria. It's just different ways to get to the point where you submit an application. It's reviewed by a, a specific panel with experts in the field. And then applications that receive competitive scores get the money. So this is, I'm going to kind of, ex I will explain the difference between these two. Next slide. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned, there's, each agency has the entry point, which is the funding announcement. And from that, you talk to a program officer and you draft your submission or your proposal, and then you submit it. And that is represented by those four doors, at least for the NIH, four different entry points. And then the one door on the side is where the money comes out. So each agency, what happens in, inside is very, very different. Next slide. So I mentioned we have the STEM IDM, that has one receipt date per year, which is coming up September 3rd. The Omnibus has three receipt dates per year. So Jan January 5th, April 5th, and usually September 5th, but this year it's, it's shifted a little bit. So um, depending on the time of year, you submit based on under what's called under one of these funding announcements. And for this next upcoming date, September 3rd, you should submit it under the STEM IDM simply because it goes to a review panel that's selected specifically for the content of the applications received. And the applications come in, they go through a review process, there's a selection process, and then the awards come out the other door. As I mentioned, it's uh, for at least NIH, uh, it doesn't make any difference which FOA you use because everything that happens inside is the same. Next slide. So what kind of topics? So the applications really can be pretty much anything that the audience, content, and so on. They can be used for classroom, out of classroom. Some projects are uh, designed to help kids with learning disabilities or to trick kids thinking if we're learning baseball, we're not really learning statistics. Uh, we have some that deal with uh, uh, drug recovery. So it's a whole range. And with the NIH, as long as it's focusing on some area of health and medicine, it's okay. The target audience ranges from kids in a classroom to the community, and you can use any platform. Obviously, your platform has to be cool to the kids and competitive with your competition out there in the market. Next slide. So um, here's a few examples. So game-based curricula, attitude changes towards learning or attitude changes about health and medicine or uh, developing skills. We'll show you one that uses uh, virtual reality to teach um, medical students or teach uh, healthcare people how to work with the body without actually working with it, group activities, citizen science projects, behavioral changes. So with it, with the NIH, we're not at prescriptive at all. It says as long as it's related to something the NIH is funding, it's fair game for one of these SBIR, or STTR proposals. Next slide. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of some of the projects we've funded. Next slide. So this is a project from the Teach League folks up in New York City. It targets uh, young learners game uh, math and fractions. So very cool. They have a whole range of topics, but it's, it's really gaming to teach kids about fractions, uh, multiplication, how to make change. But uh, this is a high level of importance for the NIH, I think for all agencies, because if, if these elementary school kids don't understand basic mathematics and fractions uh, when they're leaving, going on to middle school, their careers are really short or limited. Next slide. So this is another project. This is used uh, mixed reality to teach medical students or healthcare professionals how to work with bodies, but it's, it's quite visual and it gives them the practice that they need in a real, for, real format or at least a real uh, almost lifelike condition so that when they actually work with patients, they've got this training. Next slide. Okay, so there's a project from Squid Books, and it addresses the, the fact that the 
you know, the minority is going to majority in, in a few years. And uh, his, uh, Hispanic speaking uh, students reach, uh, have a lot of challenges. So this is a very cool project where um, it's in English and Spanish. And if they get stuck with a word, they can, they can ask the, uh, the game to teach, give them some other examples. But it, they, it's a range of projects and it's been very successful. It's, it's in its, uh, I think, finishing out the phase two component. Next slide. Here's another one I mentioned earlier. It's called um, Extra Innings, and it, it teaches kids, or at least the hook to teach kids math and statistics and some physics is the game of baseball. So initially, it's the Texas Rangers. There's another uh, Major League Baseball team that signed on. Very cool project, very visual. And in many cases, it's important, depending on the state, that you're aligned with Common Core Standards or uh, NGSS. But it's it's uh, it's one of our, our nice success stories is going live um, probably this summer. Next slide. Here's, a, here's another picture. So it's, it's very visual. It's, it's come a long ways from Pac-Man. It's, it's, it's a nice program and it, uh, it, it really uses the fact kids are playing baseball and they don't realize they're learning a lot of interesting things. Next slide. Here's the last example. This is one, it's, it's a training for entrepreneurs. Um, very nice program. It's uh, just in the phase one status, but they they provide a number of scenarios and challenge the the player, or in this case the entrepreneur, to come up with a way to uh, format their proposal, format their marketing plan, and so on. So, like I said, this is just a a snapshot of the kinds of projects that we're funding, and I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Ed, and he can talk about the Department of Ed projects. And again, we'll send your questions in now and we'll have plenty of time at the end to answer questions or clarify some of the slides. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. So here's some key dates. So the next receipt date for the interactive digital media, the IDM is September 3rd. We're gonna have a webinar uh, late July. This will be at the SEPA website. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, email me and we can schedule a time to chat. Next slide. Okay. Go ahead, Ed. Hey, Tony, thanks so much. And thanks to Tony and David for taking the lead in organizing this session today. Um, really appreciate it. And thanks for the introduction, Tony. Hi, everybody. Ed Metz from the US Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences, where I lead the SBIR program. And um, we, we're really excited today to bring reps from five different SBIR programs across different agencies, uh, great colleagues who I've known for many years and others who are newer to SBIR. And you'll, you'll be hearing from Diane, Melissa, and Brian uh, after me. So um, I'll start out by putting this SBIR webinar in context. Uh, this week, of course, is the Ed Games Expo. It's the eighth year we've done the event. And the event actually is intended to showcase the investments that the government and the SBIR program have made in uh, education technology innovation. So um, if you wanna see the types of projects that our programs have uh, supported and that are successful in terms of having developed an innovative ed tech, ed tech product that's in wide scale use, look no further than the agenda this week uh, check out the master classes by several SBIR companies for examples of some of the projects that um, we funded at the Department of Ed and NSF, NIH, and USDA, actually. Um, you can see examples across the week. So in terms of my um, talk today, I'm just going to try and be pretty quick and leave time for questions and answers at the end. Um, you know, you, someone like me could probably talk for an hour about the nitty gritty of a program like this. So there will be a lot of questions and those can be done in the chat or you can email me those as well. Next slide, please. Great. So the, the nuts and bolts here, the program at the Department of Education provides up to $1.1 million to for-profit firms for research and development, pilot testing and evaluation of new 
commercially viable education technologies across basically every topic in education to support students, educators, or administrators in regular or special education. Um, we have a very wide um, array of topics that applicants can can think about submitting a proposal for. And we're very interested in, in all the ideas because there are needs in every corner of education. And we know that a great SBIR project can very quickly within a year or two or three be created to address those pressing needs. Of course, the commercially viable um, term means that you have an eye towards creating something that can make it into the market and be sustained over time. That's that's the great thing about SBIR. It's not just creating a great innovation, it's thinking about the commercial um, distribution and sustainability. Next slide, please. So um, what's the impact of the program? In recent years, millions of students and tens of thousands of schools have used products out of the De Department of Education's SBIR program. Across all five of these programs, actually, the significant impact in the field of education because of the work that that you guys are doing out there um, in your ed tech companies. During COVID-19 in the past year and three months, dozens and dozens of SBIR supported education technology products were used to support remote learning. So it's an amazing story that the education technologies developed for school-based use we're able to convert to be used for complete remote use. Next slide, please. Some more basics here. Um, we have about a $12 million annual budget at the Department of Education. The $1.1 million includes a $200,000 phase one where the projects get to develop a prototype over the course of eight months and do pilot testing. And then the phase two if is for part of the phase one awardees to advance for the full-scale development, $900,000 over two years for additional research and development and pilot testing. The success rate is quite low, um, five to 8% in phase one. In phase two, the odds increase. So if we make about 15 phase one awards, we generally have about half of those make it to the phase two the following year. In terms of our timeline, in 2022, the program solicitation will likely be released in late 2021 with proposals due 45 days later. So sometime in early winter, the proposals are due and then we make the uh, awards within 90 days. So spring of 2022. So if you're brand new to this program, uh, about a year from now, you'll, if you're new and you apply about a year from now, you'll know. It sounds like a long time, but, um, if you're brand new to the program, you can take the next six months to really ready your, your proposal and your approach to optimize your chances of getting an award. Next slide, please. Um, definitely check out the abstracts from all the awards the past few years to get an idea of what the program funds and to see examples of the research designs and the commercialization approaches that prior awardees have uh, proposed, that will really give you kind of an insight into your approach and whether it looks like some of the others that have gotten awards. So you can check out the 2021 solicitation, which is obviously closed, um, to see the type of approach that you'll be required to present in your proposal. And then I'm available um, to give you feedback on your ideas so um, send me a one pager if you'd like, and we can schedule a call starting in late August. And I generally leave Fridays open throughout the whole fall to um, talk to you guys, to help you chisel out your, your concept and give you feedback on all the pieces that you'll need in, in place to be successful. Next slide, please. The priority areas, um, you, and you can read about these in the solicitation last year, very quickly, we're very, very interested in um, the potential of new forms of assist, assistive technologies to support students with or at risk for disabilities. 
Um, it's never been more important for technology to fill the gap and give those students just-in-time support. Um, we haven't been funding a lot of assistive technologies the past decade, and I'm really hoping that that will change with our, our new call for proposals in this area. Last year, we actually pulled out a separate solicitation. Secondly, um, it would be great if we could fund a suite of products to modernize assessment, to make assessment um, more related to students learning from their mistakes as they go, and then getting the feedback they need in real time to learn what they need to learn rather than waiting until the end of the year in the way it's traditionally been done. We're looking for new projects to prepare existing research-based or evidence-based interventions to be used at scale in education settings. There's been a ton of research the past decade and research that has actually led to effective interventions, but oftentimes those have trouble translating into interventions that can be used at scale. We've seen great examples of SBIR projects build the delivery mechanism so that that evidence-based intervention could actually be used by more students in schools. So if that aligns to what you're doing, we'd love to see, um, see your idea to scale your intervention. Another area that's really important that um, we focus on is projects to provide educators and administrators information to guide decision-making. The most obvious and painstaking example is what occurred in the past year that educators didn't have um, a go-to source to find out what education technology products would work for their classroom. So can we create a platform that gives those teachers research-based guidance on what technology products would work and for what students and for individual students, um, no students, no two students are alike. So, or, or are the same. So, It'd be great if we had a, a way to to tailor what products individual students are using to meet their individual needs. A couple more quick examples here. Um, projects to, um, obviously we fund projects that support emerging technologies and integrating them into education. And lastly, we're very interested in providing informal learning opportunities to reverse learning loss for the lowest performing students during the last year and a half. Those were our priority areas last year. We're, we'll be updating them in 2022, but you can be sure that if your ideas fit in those topics I just discussed that they'll fit in the future. We generally um, go from pre-K to post-secondary. So once again, a wide range of projects. Um, a couple more slides to go here. Next, please. So these are my quick tips if you're applying to the Department of Education's program, and they probably hopefully align to what my colleagues would say as well. Um, the concept must be new and must intend to make a significant difference in education. When I say new, it means um, it hasn't been developed before. That means you could either be taking an existing education technology product that maybe you already developed, and adding something new to it, that's totally fine. But there has to be a line in the sand between what you've already done and what you'll do next. Um, or it could be for something completely new. You haven't done any R&D before and you came up with this great idea and you wanna um, get funding to do sort of high risk, high reward R&D. Those are great projects as well. Now, one crucial note here. If you're adding something to something that already exists, maybe you have a new professional development training module to add to your existing intervention. That, that would be a great idea because it would enhance your existing intervention if teachers could be more easily trained. The key here though is that you um, know that you have to have research on what already exists you have to demonstrate that what already exists is promising or evidence-based, or our program's not gonna invest in it further. So that's crucial that you've done that research. Secondly, um, you need to include a video demo in your proposal to show the reviewers what it is that already was developed so they can decide if, if it 
is worthy of additional investment for a new component. Those are a couple of quick tips. And we see projects that every year, proposals every year that um, don't do those things. And those are very quickly given a low score by our reviewers and they don't get awarded. Another quick tip, um, you need a strong theoretical framework and prior research to support whatever it is you're doing to convince those reviewers that students would learn or that educators would be more efficient in their, in their work. Um, you need strong iterative and pilot research studies to be conducted during the project to test what it is you're doing along those lines. Make absolute certain you have a very strong education researcher on your team Generally, that means someone with a PhD who has an active research program in that area. The commercialization component is also crucial. Make sure you have um, strong letters to demonstrate that you have viable pathways to marketplace distribution. What does that mean? It means letters from partner organizations that will help you to create a plan to distribute. It could mean letters from large scale school districts that would indicate that if this product were available, they would purchase it and integrate it into their, their schools. It generally doesn't mean getting a letter from one school or one teacher. While that's incredibly impressive that anybody would write a letter for you, even one teacher or one school, um, it needs to be at a larger scale to demonstrate that if you developed it as stated, there's a large scale entity waiting to, to use it. So those letters are crucial. And, it, and you have up to three letters to include in your phase one proposal, make sure that they're great letters. Lastly, a well-rounded team, um, education research, as I noted, education practice expertise needed, high tech R&D, an expert who, if you're developing an artificial intelligence engine, do you have the team member who has done that in the past and can demonstrate that um, in, their, in their CV? Lastly, business acumen so that you have someone to um, build a viable plan for distribution for the technology. Even though nothing is developed yet, we still need to see the plans now to know that when you get to that point, that you'll know who to talk to or who to partner with and how you're gonna do it. Okay, a couple more slides here. Next, please. More funding opportunities beyond just SBIR. The Institute of Education Sciences, where I work, has a research grants program, which is a really great uh, annual funding program for researchers and developers to look at. And then across government, there are so many programs um, in different areas and we've created this document which the Wilson Center maintains, so check that out. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Um, I'll finish by thanking my colleagues for joining and also for noting the importance of the Ed Games Expo as an event to showcase the impact of the projects that we invest in across the federal government to deliver the great experience to educators and researchers out there who can demo up to 160 learning technologies. And then just to create greater collaboration across government agencies. This year we have 40 different government agencies that either invest in ed tech or lead ed tech initiatives. And um, that's, that's really exciting. If we can all work together, we can really, really build capacity and start to tackle some of these big issues we're facing in the field of education. Okay, Tony, did I keep it to like hopefully 10 minutes? I, I wasn't sure if I ran uh, over, if I went over, <laughs> went out of bounds with my time. Yeah, this is an all time record. This is the lo lowest number of minutes you've gone over in the 10 years I've known you. Way to oh, go. Okay, so I did go over, but not, it wasn't too bad. Okay, great. No, I'm going to no. stop there. Thanks, everybody. Great presentation. Thanks. Um, I'm Diane Hickey. I believe my slides are next. Uh, and you can skip to the next one as well. Uh, I think it's got, there we go. So again, I'm Diane Hickey. I'm uh, one of the new uh, SBIR um, 
program directors to enter this world of learning and cognition technologies, as we're calling them over in the National Science Foundation. So we, um, the SBIR STTR program here at the National Science Foundation, we call it America's Seed Fund. Um, and just like everybody's already said, investing up to 2 million in seed funding, we take zero equity. Um, and since 2012, and this was uh, an outside uh, entity that did the CB Insights, uh, the NSS has made nearly 3,500 awards um, to startups and small businesses um, and had 150-ish exits with 9 billion in private investment. Um, so there, this is exactly kind of what um, um, Ed was talking about of really making a, a big difference um, when we go into the world through the small businesses. Uh, this is the, if you have any questions, seedfund.nsf.gov is going to be on every slide. And then you'll also see my uh, name and uh, contact information on every slide. Next slide. So um, again, up to 2 million for your company. And the nice thing about the National Science Foundation that's slightly different than my colleagues across other agencies is we are technology agnostic and also um, topic agnostic. We will accept any great idea that can help move our nation forward, that can help keep us on the forefront of being competitive. Uh, and obviously, um, uh, education is huge for that. Um, the NSF overall, outside of the SBR program, spends a lot of money on um, STEM education research, either via through research in the universities or even on education um, every year. Next slide. We risk, we find groundbreaking, high impact, high risk technology. Um, and as far as that goes for education, we also uh, are very lucky that we get to de-risk technology that might even be too risky for um, another SBIR program. Uh, we are really looking for that high risk, high reward, and we are open to learning and cognition uh, technologies across the spectrum. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, next slide. The high risk, high reward, we get a lot of questions like, what does that mean? And am I a good fit for the NSF program? Um, if you go to the seedfund.nsf.gov forward slash apply, uh, there's an area where it says, see what we fund, but we do call out four bullet points, impact, technological innovation, market pull and scale that really we're looking to fund. Um, transformational innovation. And this is that you need to do some research, possibly development, to demonstrate the potential of the innovation. And um, typically in our program, um, the technological innovation would be based on some fundamental science or engineering research, you know, what we call evidence-based research, but it's unproven in the market. And in um, especially cognition technologies, learning technologies, there is a, a large gap between our, from what we see that we know of in the research community works, but then being able to scale it or translate it out to uh, the public or to a large amount of people to really take advantage of what we know to be true from fundamental research. Market pull. It must meet a need, solve a problem. You might have a fantastic uh, program game that everyone would love to play, but does it meet a need or solve a problem the country has right now? And obviously in um, with the past year and a half with the pandemic, um, both traditional K-12 education, um, workforce redevelopment, workforce um, training, and even I'm going to go into the learning of how to possibly sign up for a vaccine slot if you're an older American that you haven't had to do before, to learn how to do that easily and quickly so that you, you can do that. So we actually have a wide range, but there must be a need that uh, uh, and a problem to be solved. Next slide. 
So here's some statistics about the National Science Foundation, specifically SBIR program. More than half of all of our phase one proposals awarded in 2020 were from first time applicants. They'd never submitted to the National Science Foundation before, and possibly they had never submitted to any government um, entity for funding before. 95% of the 2020 uh, uh, phase one awards were awarded to startups with less than 10 employees. So very small companies. We're talking startup startups, not 450 person small companies who have a new addition to their product that needs research. And then 81% of our phase one awards in, in 2020 went to startups established within the last five years. So again, we really are talking about um, new startups, uh, new blood, new innovations, new thinking coming in and bringing all of their expertise to bear um, and to make this country better and the world better than it is yesterday. So one of the neat things is our funding will be the first money that any of these companies get. But as you'll see in a couple slides, that then validates the technology so that SBIRs can be applied for at other agencies. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you'll see some of the SBIRs awarded by the NSF and, um, and by Ed's team together uh, over this week of Ed Games. NIH, HAS, H <laughs> Health and Human Services, as, as uh, among others. Of course, there's also the opportunity for um, institutional and venture capital uh, investors come in as well, and also commercial investments from sales, partnerships, or maybe they're acquired. So we typically are the first money in to help validate the technology, uh, but then we hopefully will... Uh, not see these companies again after a phase two because they are off and running and being very successful. Next slide. So this year is new for the three topics that I run. And I'm also new this year. I started at the National Science Foundation um, last August. Um, I have an interesting background, uh, not exactly rooted in education. Um, but definitely in small companies and also in uh, a lot of informal education settings, which is great because we also, that is open for um, innovation as well. But the big topic here is learning and cognition technologies, LC. We have subtopics listed. Many of these are new to the National Science Foundation this year as far as identifying this is what we're looking for. Um, a lot of them have relationships with our current needs about collaborative networking, asynchronous and remote learning, digital learning, which could be different than asynchronous learning, um, learning disabilities and difficulties, learning and workforce development, mental health assessment and support, uh, and scalable educational enterprise systems. All of these things, there's also at the bottom other. Now, again, I wanna repeat, the National Science Foundation's SBIR program is technology and topic agnostic. Any idea is welcome. And so these subtopics are just suggestions of what we are really open for and what we're hoping some of the um, proposals that come across our doorstep fall into these buckets because uh, we could really use some innovation here. I also cover augmented and virtual reality and human computer interaction, which are very closely related to learning cognition technologies, especially in the healthcare space and the workforce development space. Next slide. So you can go to our site, again, seedfund.nsf.gov. You guys are gonna have that memorized by the time I'm done talking. Uh, our phase one current awardees are out there and our phase two current awardees are out there for the learning and cognitions technology um, topic area. Um, you'll notice some that are highlighted this week uh, across the board uh, during Ed Games Cognitive Toy Box. I believe it also has a um, masterclass, um, Museology, Myriad Sensors, which you might not recognize, but they were the first um, masterclass to go. It was Pocket Lab is their product. 
And if we went through this list and went through the lists of graduates of the phase two programs, um, we would find many, many, many companies that um, have success both in this SBIR program and in others. I know no one can read this. It's very small, not the point. If you wanna look at what we funded, you can go out there. And um, But I'm very excited about our portfolio. Very exciting uh, times to be in this field, to be helping with um, education as a whole and uh, learning across the board. Next slide. So we start with a project pitch. This was um, innovated, I think, a few years ago, three-ish. Uh, and the, the question, is, it answers the question, is your project a good fit? Uh, it's basically about a one pager, but it's all online. And it asks you all the questions that you would be asked in a proposal, but just in a shorter, a bit, uh, um, not a full fledged proposal. And it really is to benefit the small business and the PI. We don't want you to fill out a 15 page um, proposal plan, plus get all of the registrations necessary to be able to go in, to be able to submit an SBIR into the government programs if you're not a good fit for our program. So this is all done external of um, things like um, uh, research.gov. It's very quick. You can submit any time to learn if your project is a good fit. Uh, we only allow one project pitch at a time. But the nice thing is, is you should, uh, the processing time is meant to be a month, four weeks, and you'll get a response. Uh, some of us are, um, have been really overwhelmed this past year. Actually, I think the whole world has been overwhelmed this past year. Uh, and the processing time may be slightly slower, um, depending on who is your program director. But we try very hard to give you a response within a month. Then if you are a good fit, you'll be invited to submit a full proposal. If you're not, you'll get immediate feedback. You'll have to go back to the drawing board, but you can then submit another pitch again. Um, elements, technological innovation, objectives and challenges, the market opportunity and the company and team. I think these are pretty standard across the board from my colleagues. I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues who are on another screen over here. Next slide. Just like they've said before, uh, phase one, phase two, we do 256K and 1 million uh, for our phase two. There are also a number of additional phase two supplements you can get uh, along the lines of REUs, RETs, veteran research, uh, veterans that can research, um, just a number of really great partnerships to even escalate the impact. Now, um, You'll see that our funding last year was about um, 220 million. Um, we fall under other topics, so a small bit of that. Um, but then again, IT, life sciences, materials and manufacturing, electronics, and chemistry and environment, all of those could have a learning aspect to them. And those learning innovations may then now come under the learning and cognition technologies. Phase 2B uh, is a third party investment match. So if your company can get someone to invest a million dollars after you have been awarded a phase two, we will then give you another $500,000 on top of that. Next slide, please. Here are just two companies um, that I wanted to highlight. One is Prisms of Reality, Prisms VR. Uh, and what they're really, a lot of times when people look on the surface of these educational technology companies, they're like, oh yeah, the one on the right, left, the left is uh, to learn you know, algebra and the one on the right is to learn chemistry. But really the nice thing here is that Prism's reality is actually setting up the best practice pedagogy um, and immersive platform to enable others to be able to come in and do math and science on top of it in VR. So starting kind of a scaffolding for effective VR learning. I had a panel uh, discussion today um, where there was a long debate about how effective VR uh, was on learning games. And I think that uh, 
PRISMS is directly addressing um, doing it based on um, strong research-based and evidence-based learning um, versus just that it's cool. The next one is um, a product called Tablecraft. And as you'll see, this is a uh, picture that Ed shared with me and it's actually on the front of his slide. The neat thing about this that I absolutely love is it's making VR practical for classroom use regardless of resources. Um, these, this company just got awarded their phase two. I believe that even happened today. So congratulations. Um, but the neat thing is, is they really have analyzed when we talk about VR, people are like, oh, we can't give all students headsets, that's too expensive, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But uh, one of the benefits of the pandemic is almost every student in every class now has an electronic device. And Tablecraft is an opportunity where you can be in the VR as a single student. All the other students can be on some other device, be interacting in the same world at the same time, and also having the teacher be in charge of the teaching, being able to lead the exercise, being able to focus in on what um, is important. But also, these are uh, from video game developers. So the game aspect is a lot of fun. Um, you outside, if you're on your plain tablet, and you're interacting with the person who is on the VR, you can make them trip, you can mess them up. It's uh, really exactly what kids want to do to each other when they're playing games uh, and learning at the same time. So this is just two examples that I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, Prisms, I believe, has on the Oculus uh, Web Store, one of the two um, in Oculus in the lab, the app lab, one of the two educational apps out there. So you can go check out their prototype. Next slide. So if you are have an idea or have a small company that you just have this massively innovative idea that's high risk, high reward, and you want funding, <gasps> apply. Go fill out a pitch, please. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, my uh, email address is there, dhickey at nsf.gov. You can also find all my contact information online. And I look forward to seeing a lot of phenomenal pitches and proposals come across uh, our, uh, our desk, virtual desk, uh, maybe my virtual desktop space on my VR in the upcoming year. So thank you, Ed, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. And uh, thank you, um, David and uh, mm, Tony for hosting. Really appreciate it. And now to the next person who is Melinda. Okay, hi, can um, you hear me all right? I guess so. So um, my name is Melinda Kaufman and I am the USDA SBIR program coordinator. Um, and I'm very thrilled to be here at the Ed Games Expo for 2021. And I'd like to just take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about our program. Next slide, please. So um, we have a program, SBIR program goals in the USDA, and uh, they're similar, I think, across SBIR programs. It's to uh, meet the federal research and development R&D needs by stimulating technological innovation. And we want to increase private sector commercialization of innovations derived from federal R&D funding. We also want to foster and encourage participation in innovation and in entrepreneurship by women and socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. It's very important. Uh, next slide, please. So a few of the features of um, the USDA SBIR program are that, you know, the ideas are investigator initiated. Um, awards are based on scientific and technical merit, um, the commercial potential of the innovation, and the qualifications of the company in general and the PI in particular. Um, we encourage subcontracting to USDA 
uh, to universities and to USDA labs. Um, and success metrics from receiving an SBIR grant include increasing the number of new jobs that are created in the United States, um, and increasing sales of technology or services developed and sale to other businesses of licenses to the SBIR technology that was developed. Next slide, please. We have an annual budget around 25 million um, and we have funding opportunities for SBIR grants only. Um, so we don't have, in other words, we don't have an ST our program yet, um, but that may come in the future. So for phase one, um, it's an eight month long um, duration and it's capped at $100,000. Our phase two is two years um, in duration and it's capped at $600,000. Um, award success rates for phase one in uh, fiscal year 2019, we had a 14.8% success rate, 79 out of 533 applications. And for FY20, we had a 16.1% um, success rate, um, 70 out of 435 applications. And then for phase two, we had um, in FY19, we had a 40.6% success rate. In FY20, we had a 42.6% success rate. And then we also have technical and business assistance, which I'll tell you about more in the next slide, please. So what is technical and business assistance or TABA as we call it, or TABA, however you wanna pronounce it. Um, it was introduced as part of the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019. It can, um, TABA can include things like market research, uh, intellectual property costs, um, ideas for marketing, um, consult, consult, consultations on funding strategy or activities related to manufacturing, uh, financial reviews. It's, there's a right, wide variety of um, um, information and assistance that can be given around these things and others. So for phase one, you um, can request $6,500 for TABA. That is um, beyond your budget. So it doesn't come out of your budget. This is in addition to your budget. So the, for phase one, it's 6,500 um, and they will help, to, to develop a commercialization plan, which um, is something that's required for a phase two submission. And then for phase two, it's uh, $50,000. Um, and that again is beyond your budget. So if you uh, request the maximum budget of 600,000 and request TABA, you can get, um, or arrange TABA, you can get $650,000, but 50,000, has to be used for TABA. Um, and so that is for the, you know, further development of commercialization plans, you know, moving forward, you're gonna get closer, of course, in phase two to commercialization. And so it's more refined and technical plan. Next slide, please. So here are our topic areas. Um, <clears throat> we have 10 topic areas. Um, we have force and related resources. We have two plant and production, production and protection topic areas. One is 8.2 biology, and the other is um, 8.13 um, engineering. And then we also have animal and production and protection, conservation and natural resources, food science and nutrition, community and rural development, aquaculture, biofuels and bio-based products, small and mid-sized farms. So um, a couple of things with these topic areas for um, educational um, topics, it's most common that those will fall within rural and community de development 8.6 or 8.12 um, small and mid-sized farms or 8.5 food science and nutrition. There's not, they're not limited, educational technologies are not limited to those, but those are just the most common areas. And then we also have high um, or, or in red font, 8.6 and 8.12,
because for those, um, you don't have to use a completely new innovation. You can um, apply a, an off the shelf product technology um, to, in an innovative way in those two topic areas. So you can just have a new use for an existing technology just in those two areas. Next slide, please. And this is just a sampling of um, some of the areas that um, the USDA SBIR program uh, incorporates in, in um, their SBIR program. Uh, you know, everything from IT to nanotechnology to acoustics to basic physics and chemistry, biofuels, food safety. Um, on just, it isn't a comprehensive list. That's just a sampling of the science that we use. Next slide, please. So uh, to give you an idea of the timeline, um, generally speaking for phase one, we try to release the RFA in July. We're hoping that uh, it'll be July for the, this year, 2021, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the proposal deadline will be in, uh, usually in October and we're shooting for early October this year, 2021. Um, and then the panels will be held in January of 22, and notifications will hopefully be sent out in February of 22, and awards made in March or April of 22. And then for phase two, <clears throat> and it's just important to note that only phase one awardees um, can apply for phase two. There is no option for straight to phase two. Um, so, uh, that timeline is we're planning to have, um, and we usually have the RFA released in December of every year. So December this year, and then the deadline um, will be in March of 2022, panels in May of 22, notifications in June, and awards made in July, August of 22. Next slide, please. Um, Ella, I want to tell you a little bit about our review process. So all of the proposals are panel reviewed by a panel um, of outside experts. We'll have a panel manager who is an outside um, expert who organizes and runs the panel. And the panel members come from a, a range um, of areas, from federal labs to academia, nonprofits, industry. So we try to get a mix of all those. Um, both phase one and phase two panelists are, um, we, we use ad hoc reviewers in addition to our panelists. Um, and <clears throat> all applicants receive verba verbatim copies of their reviews, um, which is very useful for phase one because you can use that to refine, um, if, you, if you want to, you can use it to refine your um, proposal and resubmit next year if you're not chosen. Um, phase one applicants that are not selected, you know, can again um, re re resubmit the next solic solicitation cycle. And again, phase two applicants are only able to apply at one time, one time only. Next slide, please. And then we have. Um, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements, or CRADAs, um, which they're an additional factor that are considered in the re review process, um, whether a phase one or phase two applicant has a CRADA with a USDA laboratory or a license to a USDA technology. So in the event that the two proposals are approximately at equal merit, um, it can make a difference to have a credit agreement with a USDA laboratory or a license to a USDA technology. So keep that in mind if you have the opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. So here are a few, some factors that might improve chances of award success. Um, so high you know, scientific or technical merit and high commercial potential. We are also kind of like NSF, um, we're starting to transition more to looking at high risk, high reward 
So um, we're probably not as far along with that as NSF, but we're we're kind of looking at that more. So um, don't shy away if you feel you have an innovation that's high risk and high reward. We're looking for those. Um, also having good consultants, and again, the credit agreement, uh, having some business expertise available to you on your team or available somehow. Um, and having strong letters of support, I think that's been mentioned in some of the other presentations. Um, for your phase three partners, that means you know end users, um, consumers, investors. That those are pretty important. So try to secure those uh, if you can. Um, and then you just need to, to have a clear understanding of the bar market and how your going to enter the market and sustain yourself in the market. Next slides, please. More advice for uh, phase one applicants. Please, um, if you think of it as providing a vision of where you wanna be, not at the end of phase one, but at the end of phase two, I think that will you know, catch the panel's eye and um, really show that you have a well thought out proposal. Um, so well, along with that, think about what is the market opportunity and where do I want to be, you know, approximately three years from now. Uh, focus on phase one on uh, research on the critical enabling factors. Um, sell the importance of your project and um, the alignment with USDA priorities, which are outlined in the RFAs. So, uh, and then provide a detailed experimental plan in your proposal and include proprietary information um, and provide insight into the commercial potential and show the connectivity with communities you're intending to serve. Um, that goes going back to get those user, uh, letters of support from you know, various people who will be using the product. Next slide, please. Uh, more, yet more advice for phase one. Um, gets your registrations completed early. Um, I have to tell you that uh, we had an applicant um, who had everything ready but did not get his um, SAM.gov um, in on time. And so he missed our deadline last year. And so he had to wait another year. So get those in early. It's not going to hurt to do that. SAM.gov, you get done grants.gov, SBIR. And then um, contact one of our topic area leaders for a consult. And the best way to contact them is really to just do a very informal one or two paragraph email and send it to them and request uh, a time for a consult. Um, and then follow, follow all the guidelines for format page limits required docs. That's really important because we do um, an administrative review after the grant closes. And, you know, if you go over the page limits or you don't follow those guidelines, um, you can get kicked out of the process at the beginning, unfortunately. And the most important thing I can probably tell you today is to read the RFA. Almost all your questions can be answered in the RFA. Um, and then, uh, you know, apply early if you can. Next slide, please. So um, I want to tell you a success story. Um, we were uh, limited on time, so I only have one for you. But um, if you'll uh, go to the next slide, I'll tell you about it. We have uh, seven generation games, which I believe is taking, play, uh, taking part in the Egg Games Expo. Um, so they, these creators merge game design and technology to improve math skills for grades three through eight. And Aztec Games was a specific game developed using SBIR funds. Um, so they combined the math skills with um, using storylines from history, actually. So you're getting you know, two things there. Um, the games teach, test, understanding, and track progress. Um, educational research was used to develop these games. And um, the games are available in rural areas as well as urban areas, which you know the Department of Agriculture were very interested in, uh, you know, uh, working with rural areas. Last slide, please. 
Again, I'm Melinda Kaufman. I'm the SBIR program coordinator, and we also have our SBIR program specialist, Kelly McDonald. And you can reach us at this email address below here, sbir at usda.gov. Thank you, and thank you to Tony, Ed, and David for uh, inviting us. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Bard, and I work at the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. That's NIDLER for short. Um, NIDLER is under the Administration for Community Living, otherwise known as ACL. And ACL is under the Department of Health and Human Services. It's important to note that we are not part of the National Institutes of Health. Next slide, please. So a little bit of history here, let me close this. I'm not gonna read this whole slide to you, um, but um, NIDLER was technically created as the Rehabilitation Research Program in 54. Um, in 1980, we were moved to the Department of Education. I used to work with Ed Metz, a wonderful guy. Uh, and uh, in 1986, our name was changed to NIDER, uh, National Institute on Rehabilitation, I'm sorry, National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. In the summer of 2014, the Rehab Act was authorized as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, and that's when NIDLER, the IL, was added in there, which stands for Independent Living, and we were moved over to the Department of Health and Human Services under ACL. Um, and again, we're not part of the NIH. Next slide, please. Uh, NIDLER's SBIR program is unique in that its sole purpose is to increase the commercial application in R&D to improve the return on investment for people with disabilities. Um, our budget is very small. It's 3.2 million per year. That's our SBIR budget. NIDLER's budget is just over 100 million, um, maybe 115, but our extramural research is much less than 100 million, but we like the SBIR program, so we still participate. NIDLER is very small. We hold one phase competition, phase one competition each year, usually at the very beginning of the year and one phase two sometime in the spring. But based on um, guidance from the GAO, we may be changing this a little bit and releasing our phase ones late in the year and having the competition close sometime in January. Next slide, please. Uh, so our phase one, of course, like everyone else, and, and by the way, I should say that a lot of what um, my colleagues had to say here today applies to our program as well. I'm going to be stealing a lot of material from your slides. Um, so of course, phase one is a prototype proof of concept phase. We only award $100,000 for each phase one for a six month project period. We generally make about 10 awards per year and we get 50 to, now it's up to about 70 applications. And of course, phase two is to further that R&D to bring phase one concepts to commercialization. Um, our phase twos are $575,000 for two years. That's not a lot of money. And um, we expect to see progress in the direction of commercialization. The reviewers expect to see that progress, but um, we don't always expect uh, something that's polished and ready to go to market, but we do wanna see steps in that direction we generally make four or five phase two awards each year. You know, we usually get about 14 to 17 eligible applications. We accept only phase one grantees, but throughout the federal government, and we accept phase two applications from phase one grantees who finished their phase one in the past three years. So this year um, it's uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021 we generally have about eight or 10 active awards. And next slide, please. So here's a link to prior phase one awards on our database. It's called NARIC, uh, NARIC.com. These links will take you there. Don't worry about writing that down. Um, so they're both live and they're both uh, updated regularly. Um, please do cl click on these links because you'll get an idea of the kind of kinds of things we fund and uh, you'll see abstracts, you'll see contact information, you'll see project officer information, principal investigator information, and you'll see examples like low vision, uh, which would include navigation, readers, tactile devices, um, mobile apps. 
I have to take this off this slide now. The time has come because we no longer fund mobile apps. Um, not for phase one. If you have a phase, if you have a phase two and it's you know derived from a successful phase one mobile app application or project, we will continue that funding. Uh, your application will be eligible, but we are not accepting any more mobile app applications. And we have reasons for that, but we also have um, a mobile app factory, which is a much more guided process to developing mobile apps. And we funded research that indicated that the SBIR program is not the best um, avenue for funding mobile apps because of the time involved, the money involved, and the, and the changing landscape that a phase one and a phase two three year project doesn't account for uh, if anyone wants that study feel free to send me an email we do prosthetics and fitting portable dialysis switches for severe mobility impairments learning software for hearing hearing aid software signing wheelchair navigation propulsion telerehabilitation etc um, the priorities listing in our funding opportunity announcement uh, I'll just summarize them. Uh, employment is a big one, especially access. These are just preferential priorities, however. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, invitational priorities. These are not preferential. No points are given for meeting any of these invitational priorities. But we're interested in, we were working with the Department of, uh, the Department of Labor's Office of Di Disability Employment Policy to help make online applications websites more accessible especially to people with cognitive disabilities. Um, increased independence uh, in community settings through technology, uh, enhanced sensory or motor function, um, enhanced workforce participation, community living and participation is very big, improved healthcare interventions, and technology that may increase access to caregiving for individuals with disabilities. Um, now, a couple of things while we're on this slide. Um, we, um, we, we um, again, we don't fund mobile apps any longer, but please uh, ask me for a link to that because we don't fund it through SBIR, but we fund it in other ways. Uh, I'll wait for the rest of these. Next slide, please. So these links um, provide a lot of information in applying for a grant. I could make this presentation 30 slides long if I included all this stuff in, in my presentation. So please do go visit grant grants.gov and the, the the second link under grants.gov is a link to the keywords that will lead you to the opportunities that we have at Nidler not all of which are SBIR we have a lot of other funding mechanisms that you may be interested in as well that develop technology um, there's information here about working with a Nidler grant about reporting we have technical assistance available we don't do TABA but we have TA available through the life sciences program through um, uh, sbir.gov local assistance, through the FAST program that's funded by the SBA. And we also have a new grantee who's providing this kind of assistance that I didn't have time to put on this slide, um, but it's uh, an in-house technical assistance. Other links are to Nidler's SBIR program, more information about Nidler, including all of our funding mechanisms, and a link to that NARIC website that I told you about that holds all of our projects, as well as information about Nidler. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that you can do, and, and here's some things that are different, by the way, uh, about Nidler before I give you this slide. Um, we we um, hire all of our review panels ad hoc. We don't have a second level of review. We pretty much go, go by reviewer recommendations and, and fund pretty much in that order. Um, we don't have, uh, the NIH has a 40% indirect cost rate that they allow. We don't have that authority, so we can only offer the de minimis cost rate unless you have a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. Then, of course, we would honor that. But if you don't have one, you can only take 10%, whereas in NIH, you can take 40%. Um, the indirect cost comes out of the grant, not on top of it. Um, we don't, again, we're a very small agency with a very small budget. So we can't, you know, just throw um, eight or ten thousand dollars on top of each award. Um, uh, let's see. Um, our uh, our commercial success is actually somewhere over fifty percent. That is, our phase two grantees 
have uh, reached an excess success rate and commercialization of just over 50%. Our phase one application success rate hovers at around 15% and our phase two funding success rate hovers at, a, in, at around the mid 20% range. Um, if you want to vet any ideas, just send an email to me directly and we're very small so I can work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Some other suggestions, and I'll be stealing some of these because I don't have a slide for them, but follow the criteria format. It's a very criteria-driven review. Um, and, and like uh, Diane, we offer all of the comments from the reviewers to the applicants, and um, we don't give names. We just give all of their comments, and that's because we're very interested in capacity building. Um, if you want to get started on a funding opportunity announcement, send me an email and ask me for the most recent funding opportunity announcement. Uh, next year's won't be exactly the same, but it'll be close and it can get you started. Um, uh, my email is on the last slide, by the way. Um, the, uh, when you're writing your application, write to the person on the street because we get, we, we, our panels are 10 applications each and five reviewers each. We will get applications that range from you know, low vision to hearing loss to cognitive disabilities, perhaps all on the same panel. And you have to, you know, we have to hire a panel with experience in all those areas. So if you're proposing an application for wheelchair propulsion, uh, you may not have expert, you're gonna have some experts on your panel. You're gonna have an expert in, in wheelchair use. You're gonna have a seating expert. You're gonna have a, a small business expert. And a, or a commercialization expert, but you're not going to have you know all five people experienced in your technology. So write to the person on the street. Also, don't speak from personal knowledge or experience. Anything that you say, like if you say there's a uh, three million people in the country who use wheelchairs, you need to cite that. Whatever your problem is, whatever information you're providing to the reviewers, you have to show them where you got that information. Don't just speak from personal knowledge or experience, cite that knowledge and um, know the state of the art as well and present that to the reviewers. What, what are you proposing? What's already out there and why is your idea better? Uh, okay, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you back up one slide? I'm very sorry. Donate your brain to science. That means become a peer reviewer. If you click on this link, that's a link to our peer reviewer training module. It'll give you information on how our review is run. And if you're interested in applying with us at any time, or even with some other agencies, although we are different, um, but especially if you wanna to apply to us, please be a reviewer. You'll learn a lot. You'll get an inside track to that. And there's a link to the information. If you wanna be a reviewer, please send me your interest followed by your resume or CV. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, well, so this is questions. I don't believe I'll be taking questions directly um, but I think we are as a panel, more or less. So next slide, please. And there's my contact information, uh, phone number, and email. Um, okay, thanks very much for inviting me to this, and uh, let, let me know if I can address any questions specifically. Well, thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, this is I always love these uh, group presentations because I learned so much about the other agencies. I'd like to address a couple of generic questions and then go through some of the key ones. Uh, we have about, in theory, five minutes left, but we don't have another group hanging out in the back of the meeting room wanting to get in, so we can go as long as we have questions. If you have to leave early, I would suggest you send your questions to all five of the presenters and we can send something back. Um, or alter alternatively, you can just send it to me and I'll send it out to my colleagues. One of the things I want to talk about we use all these acronyms. The feds are good at acronyms. So we have FOA, so Funding Opportunity Announcement. We have an RFA. They're all the same thing. It just depends on the length of time. So with the NIH and some of the other agencies, an RFA a request for applications is a one time only. So it's published one time. And you saw several examples of that. With the NIH and I'm, I think some of the other agencies, we have an FOA, a Funding Opportunity Announcement. And these tend to be three year announcements. Uh, another question we got, was about piggybacking in IES and NIH funding announcement. Each agency is separate. So in the application process, one of the first things you fill out is which is this funding opportunity, you know, what is, what is the solicitation that you're submitting it to? And so with the NIH, as I mentioned, we have two, two alternatives. One is the ambus, the other is the specific. Um, one of the colleagues made a very important point. 
and I'd like to even push it further, it's, it's critical that you read the funding announcement or the RFA. And I always tell people, don't read it, study it, because most of the questions are answered there. Um, the, uh, um, like I said earlier, all the agencies have the same starting point and ending point, but what happens in between is, is very different. And so one of the things, one of the other questions uh, I'd like to address is, uh, and it, it also addresses the, the issue that some agencies have both SBIR and SCTR, others only have SBIR. Uh, one of the questions is, and it, it deals with direct to phase two. So I didn't mention that, but with, at least with the NIH, you can do a phase one, you can do a fast track, which is a combined phase one plus phase two, and you can also go direct to phase two. So uh, with any of these, uh, if you have questions, the important thing is to contact the either the person in the listed in the funding announcement as the point of contact or one of us. Now, one of the other uh, um, concepts I wanted to talk about is the, uh, the review process. So each of the agencies has a panel. Sometimes they're selected um, on the basis of a uh, standing study section. Sometimes it's not. So what I'd like to toss out to the uh, the, the speakers, and we'll go in the same order that we presented so we don't uh, uh, step on each other's toes, but with the NIH, we have a process where the, you talk to the program officer, uh, getting all the questions answered, then you submit your application, and it goes to somebody who runs the review. And for the NIH, uh, we get a priority score, usually based between 10 and about 50, and the, the projects are the awards are made based on the priority score, not necessarily whether or not we have other uh, projects with similar topics. So I'll, I'll s send it next to Ed, and he can talk about the selection process uh, with the Department of Ed, and then we'll go through the, the line. Because in some agencies, uh, it's made by the program officer. In other agencies, it's more of a committee process. So how is it done at Ed, Ed? Great. Very quickly, it's uh, government team members are the reviewers. So it's an independent review done by government team members, not external. And what is the selection process based on priority score or priority score plus uh, um, program priorities? Program Sorry content. about that. There, uh, the evaluation criteria are listed in the solicitation. So those exact criteria that you read about are the exact criteria that the reviewers will use to give you a score out of 100. There are three reviewers and those reviewers um, will each give a score and the score will be averaged together. The top average scoring proposals get the awards each year. I guess it's my turn and you might have to uh, dumb down the question a little bit for me being a newbie to the federal government. Um, but the NSF, we first do that pitch process and the people who evaluate the pitch are on our team in the SBIR office. Um, and what we're looking for is again, the good fit that you um, have something innovative, technically um, you're the right size, small company, those types of things. Um, and it's, it's basically a, 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 an up down um, and then you can be invited. Then if you're invited for a proposal, our, um, <clears throat> our review process it's typically panel, but we can do ad hoc. Um, we will get a panel of experts outside the government. Um, typically, in we'll get commercial and technical um, reviewers. And for our phase two, we must have both commercial and technical. And for an educational technology or for learning and cognition technology, it is very difficult uh, to get a panel of experts to cover all of the expertises we need. Um, and so uh, today I, uh, so we'll have panels that you'll have six experts review the same proposal just to make sure we're covering um, practicality of implementation, commercial ability, commercialization. Now what the reviewers are reviewing on are the two main criteria that every proposal that comes into the National Science Foundation gets reviewed on, intellectual merit, broader impact, and then the SBIR program adds commercial viability. Did I answer the questions? And we only have yes. phase one and then phase two. We don't have any direct to any things. Mm -hmm. 
maybe I'm next, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we have the same as Diane just described, just phase one, phase two, no direct to phase two. And we have uh, each topic area has a national program leader. Uh, and But for panels, the national program leader finds a panel manager and the panel manager is outside of um, the USDA and uh, runs the panel uh, and, you know, gets experts from um, all over from industry and nonprofits and all around and academia. And so that's how those panels are composed. And each um, panelist reviews a certain number of proposals depending on the topic area and how many proposals there are and how many panel managers there were. But they they get um, usually a month or more to review those proposals. Um, and then, um, then it's discussed in panel. And so the, each, each proposal has three reviewers and so they discuss it, but the whole panel can participate. Um, unless there's a conflict of interest, I won't go into all that, but there's a way to, you know, uh, separate people who have a conflict of interest. So um, that's, and then they're categorized, um, you know, into high priority, medium priority, lower priority, and then there's a triage portion. And then they go through all of the proposals that way. And then um, at the end, they go back with that view of all the proposals for that topic area, they go back and just um, revisit the top uh, number of proposals. It, that is all depending on funding and how much funding they have, so how many proposals they can fund. So they just make sure by reviewing it again. Thank you. Sure. If I can remember the question correctly, um, as long as you meet the needs of people with disabilities, the rest of this is pretty much field initiated. So there's no, um, there's no internal review process. If you meet all the criteria uh, set forth by SBA and you meet the needs of people with disabilities and you're within the last three years and your budget's not over and all that stuff, then, then you're, uh, we're gonna review you. Thanks, Ryan. So as you can see, um, each agency is a little different, but the key is studying carefully the funding announcement. So Nathan had a question. Do you have a preliminary proposal process like NSF? I think this was directed to the NIH. Um, again, each funding announcement or each solicitation will have some information if you have questions. Um, for the STEM games program at NIH, we don't have a white paper to pre-qualify. I just tell people, they send me an email, I say, let's schedule a call and everybody gets 30 minutes and we just discuss what they wanna do, who's on the team, the target audience, and at that point, we can say, yes, what you're proposed to do is uh, within, we call within the scope. So Ed, how does it work with you guys? Well, as I said earlier, um, if you have a concept, you can send me a one page concept paper. And I can't tell you if it's gonna be accepted or not, if you submit it as a full proposal, but I can talk to you about the strength of the concept. Informal process process before the solicitation comes out. Now, as you, as Diane noted, um, you know, NSF has this wonderful process where you can send in a preliminary proposal and they'll get, they'll tell you whether or not it advances to full proposal. Uh, unfortunately, at the Department of Ed, you could spend, you know, weeks writing a 15 page proposal that, that, you know, doesn't, doesn't advance. So, um, you know, make that decision wisely of whether or not to do the whole proposal. And I'm just gonna pop in and, and say that was actually born of necessity, I'm pretty sure. Um, many of you have been very generous in saying, call me, talk to me. We're gonna tell you if this is a good fit. Uh, we have a lot of people who call and ask if this is a good fit. So I think that that's how our program move to um, efficiently uh, answering those questions. Um, and we try to be as fair as possible, um, knowing that I could give insight into how to apply that might make one applicant 
didn't have a little bit of an edge, but not meaning to just because you hit on my favorite thing of zero to five year old education, because I feel that Head Start is like the best thing for lifelong benefit. So anyway, uh, just wanted to, to pop that in as to one of the reasons why we do that. I'd rather talk to a real person. Melinda? Uh, for USDA, um, uh, we have those national program leaders that ha are over the 10 topic areas. And I just want to say that our topic areas are pretty broad. Um, so, you know, for the purpose of being able to uh, capture all innovations, you know, is that you'll be able to fit somewhere. But then sometimes it causes a little bit of confusion as to which topic area you fit in. And that's one of the reasons we highly suggest that you talk to a national program leader. So choose, you know, look at the RFA, choose the topic area that you think you most are closely aligned with. If you're not sure, just make that part of the conversation you have with the, the national program leader. Do I fit better here or do I fit better there? And you know, they should be able to help guide you with that. So um, having that consultation with the national program leader is the best way to go. Brian, any additional thoughts? I think Brian may have uh, departed for the day. <laughs> yeah, I think I got kicked off. Is my voice back? Yes. OK, uh, another question. How many applications can I submit at one time? So with the NIH, it says, unless it's otherwise specified, you cannot do this um, in the funding announcement or the solicitation, the NIH says, as long as they're different, you can submit as many as you want. However, I always tell people, um, focus on doing, submitting one application that's gonna knock the panel socks off rather than uh, two or three that are kind of mediocre. So the question for the other folks is, how many can you submit from your, you know, for your agency at, at a single time? Diane. One. Oh, one. Okay. Um, there's, yeah, there's, I, we have the same guidance that you just noted, Tony, that um, applicant, you know, companies can send in multiple proposals. However, doing one proposal is a pretty serious undertaking. So best to do that one really well. It's the same for USDA as for Ed and, uh, and Tony's program. So um, you you are allowed to as long as they're different, you're allowed to submit as many as you like, but might not be advisable. Okay, another question: we have, Can I have a foreign component? I've got an expert in doing VR programming, but they're in Europe. Is this allowed? Uh, this, these are taxpayer dollars, and I'm pretty sure it's consistent across the federal agencies, but. Um, all of the consultants and folks you pay and cost you uh, obligate has to be U.S. companies. Uh, another question is the page limitations. So with the NIH, and I would guess most of the other agencies, at least for the omnibus solicitation that covers a number of agencies, the phase one is six pages for the research plan. Now you got a lot of other pages uh, standard questions about your company, and then you've got human subjects, and you've got letters to support. But the phase one is six pages. It's proof of principle. Um, that's pretty much it. You don't have a lot of money, a lot of time, so you create your widget. You do some preliminary testing to find out whether or not your target audience is interested in it. It's, you know, from my perspective, it's good to have some milestones that you meet that uh, got kind of go, no go. And even though there's no requirement in the NIH for discussion of a commercialization plan in phase one, I always tell folks, don't come in cocky, but just come in uh, with a sense of confidence that the phase one is a slam dunk. Uh, you're looking at phase two. Uh, you want to toot any successes you've had. But it's really important to put in a few lines that convince the panel that, A, you know who the competition is. You know what's out there. And secondly, uh, you're already thinking about commercialization. I think this is good for the phase one. The phase two is uh, 
12 pages for the research plan, 12 pages for the commercialization plan. And another point is when you have a fast track phase one plus phase two, um, it's got to be, it's a package deal. If you have a brilliant phase two, but your phase one is, is not very good, you can't separate them out. So getting back to the, um, the page limit, I'm pretty sure it's the same across the federal agencies. Six pages, the six months proof of principle for phase one and the phase two is, uh, it depends. It could be a year, it could be two years. It's agency specific, but that's where you really get down to the nuts and bolts and create your product. So thoughts from other folks. Well, we have a, you know, we have a page, page limit, you know, guidance, um, and it's in the solicitation. But uh, once again, you know, I think your guidance, Tony, is great that every, every agency has a different approach um, regarding the structure of proposals or applications. Tony, I have to tell you, I have to head out in a minute for another event, so I'm going to be signing off. But I want well, to thank a- you again for... For, uh, for hosting this, really appreciate it. And I hope everybody found it as informative as I did. And I, I really appreciate working with uh, all my colleagues across the agencies and we'll definitely do this again next time. Thank you, Ed. Well, yeah, thanks for all the work you thanks put into the Ed Games Expo. It's really evolved over the last decade from you know, going to building 1370 downtown and uh, wandering around in the dark and a lot of games to the Kennedy Center uh, events. So thanks again for your contribution. Yeah, Diane, we um we blew out the power in the second year of the Ed Games Expo. So Tony remembers that moment well, where all of our games and tech, uh, you know, were ahead of their time. The power surge caused the uh, lights to go out. That's a great so that's a story. Great, <laughs> that's a great note to uh to end the event, Tony. If you think it's the right time. Yeah. So the last thing is. Um, I mentioned contact us if you have any questions. There was a question about the um, the July uh, event. It's going to be a two-hour webinar going really into the deep details. Uh, that'll be available at the SEPA website. Um, the best way to get this is to get this information is send, any, send a request for the PowerPoint. We'll send that off to you and any relevant contact information for either the links for the events or contact information for the speakers. But um, thank you so much, uh, Diane and Melinda. This is the first time I've met you folks. Uh, I don't know if Brian's still on. So, uh, and for the audience, thanks very much for taking time. Uh, we're, we're pleased that you're interested in this, this technology to uh, bring learning and behavioral changes to people that, you know, particularly kids who uh, have a hard time sitting in a classroom with a blackboard and a textbook certified by the Texas education system. This is, this is real learning. So um, goodbye everybody. And thanks so much. And David and Alyssa and the NIGMS IT folks. Thanks again for a uh, well-run, well-oiled machine.